My name is Michelle Steinwald, Assistant Curator for Performing Arts at the Walker Arts Center. And last night was the world premiere of Supernature by Body Cartography Project. I'm here today with Otto Ramstead and Olive Bringa from Body Cartography Project. Welcome. Hi. Thanks, Michelle. Hi. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for doing this right mm -hmm. after the big premiere last night. Mm -hmm. You've been working so hard on this piece and for so long with so much research. I'm really glad we're going to take this time to talk about all the research. Um, how does it feel to get it up and see it all together with an audience? Well, to be honest, I, I don't know if I've kind of landed that it <laughs> actually went up yet, but in terms of like just like cognitively, I think there was a moment in the show when I was just talking about a couple of minutes ago um, where the opening of the show, like the audience had one feeling of like, they were laughing and really enjoying themselves. And then there was a point in the show when we, we uh, physically kind of dropped into another place and then they, the audience also dropped into that place at the same time. And I, that was a really good feeling mm -hmm. where I felt like something landed and we, we changed the whole room. Mm -hmm. And, and the audience came with. Yeah. Yeah, that was clear. Yeah. That was and good. so that, that felt great to actually, just even that moment of landing, go, coming from somewhere and landing somewhere else and then taking off of there felt great to have that experience. And then the other thing I'll say, because I, is it was a really curious experience because we're on stage in the beginning, well, in the, begin, in the very beginning, beginning, we're out in the spaces around the walker and the lobbies and in the hallways. And, and then we come on stage and we were uh, on stage for 10, 15 minutes. And I felt like after all that time, like almost an hour for 45 minutes of being in, in our material and with the public in different ways, I really felt like when we were, performing and doing our work that I had made such a relationship with the people and the whole space and we'd been here for so many times leading up to the show that it felt like we were just welcoming more people into our work versus like this is the show now right you know like I felt like we were you know obviously Zena and Olive and Emmett and and you Michelle and other people that we've been working on this piece for like a year and a half were in the in the space and I felt those people and just there's all these other people in in our space and so it was a different feeling of not like confronting the audience like mm -hmm. with your work like here mm -hmm. it is but just kind of pulling them into it yeah mm -hmm. extended yeah and the so circle I, yeah and I felt like I didn't I felt like a, not as adrenalized and yeah. and like I'm you know I feel full in what I'm doing and what we're offering but I didn't feel like that kind of harsh cliff thing, mm -hmm. you know, with a mm -hmm. show sometimes mm -hmm. that you're like jumping into it and now, whoa, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. It felt like it was just a much more organic process. And I think that has come from the research and the structure that came out of the research about empathy and in inclusion and connection mm -hmm. and, and all the different levels of that. And do, and in a kinesthetic subcortical way, yeah. it laid some sort of ground that really made a different experience for me. And you're working from inside the piece because you're performing. Yeah, that's right. And I'm all sitting of in your the house. house. <laughs> How yeah, was that? Yeah. And I have no control <laughs> over anything. And I like walked around in the pre-show and it was super fun. I like cruised around because I know where everything's happening and I'm like getting to like do loops around the building with Emmett and kind of check out what's going on and watch people noticing or not noticing and asking Walker staff what's happening and they're like, I don't know. It's really, really, really fun. And then uh, coming into the theater, I just got more and more anxious. And I, it's like there's no outlet, like I have no outlet somehow. And then I, I, I'm sort of reading some of what the audience is feeling. And then I also feel like I'm holding so much kind of um, anticipation or agitation that by the end of the show, I'm just like, can't even talk to anybody. <laughs> I'm just like, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it was exciting. And I really look forward to tonight and tomorrow night and, and letting myself land in that experience of mm -hmm. sort of finding comfort a little mm -hmm. bit more mm -hmm. with, with 
the excitement that's in the piece because I think the material is really working with breaking expectation over and over again. And so I know that having gotten a little bit of feedback now about last night, I know that on some level it's working and I need to just kind of take it easy in the audience and kind of enjoy that a little bit more. So that's my, because I think the dancing was beautiful last night. I think they did great, so. Yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> and this is kind of your biggest, most ambitious project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. you started the research. I've had a lot of people ask me about how specifically the research in the galleries, mm -hmm. what was brought into the process for what we saw. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In the show. So there were a number of scores that people were improvising and using within the context of the installation uh, that we work with more formally within the piece. And so on some level there was this experience of people kind of improvising with the material. The, the performers. The performers. performers. And then um, there was the research of also what it is to have an audience member like right up next to you looking at every surface of your body only not only what you're presenting you know to a front mm -hmm. you know with an audience on one side so there was a level of intimacy kinesthetic you know kind of engagement that i felt um an excitement that people had at, as performers in the installation they wanted to generate for this show or bring in that feeling mm -hmm. in performing in this show in this more you know traditional mm -hmm. context and so that was part of the drive to create the pre-show that they could then try and recreate mm -hmm. that for themselves um, and build relationships with different people who would then come into the theater you know and had an experience with maybe one or two of those people so 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 that speaks to a little bit of it also i think in terms of the the audience who came, they also would have built, who came to the installation, they also would have built relationships with some of the performers from being in that experience with them. And then I think, you know, I don't know, maybe you want to speak more to the, to what actually happened in the installation too, like in terms of, because I think for me, what I learned, which is always like, it's like a relearning, it's like you can never assume you really know what's going on mm -hmm. in somebody's head. Mm -hmm. So when you're performing on stage and the audience is like sitting here like this and you think everyone's hating it or you think mm -hmm. everyone's deeply focused, you just don't know. Like until you really sit with them afterwards and have because a, you did. a conversation. Because you, you had quite, you as... The, it was one on one, one performer yeah. to one audience member. You took time after they exited the installation to ask them questions. What type yeah. of questions did you ask yeah. them? Well, not with everybody, right? But with, quite but with a, fair quite a, with a yeah. fair amount of people. I think it was pretty basic, like what happened? Mm -hmm. What happened for you? And then I think, so I think what I was going to continue saying, it's like, even in that context where you're just one, with one person in that room, you still can't assume but you can get a much clearer reading. And so if that person is excited and engaged, it's very easy to keep doing what you're doing. But what if they're really uncomfortable? Right. Or they're really like, they appear to be very not, like really not engaged. How do you continue to have compassion for them, compassion for yourself so that you can stay in the dance mm -hmm. and stay in the physicality and stay mm -hmm. in the research? Like that, so I think, on that level, it was a training for the performers in mm -hmm. one way. And then I think, and, I, and so I feel all of that comes into the show on a very personal level for people. Um, I don't know, do you want to speak more to how it informs the choreography or? I think it was just, uh, well, because we're working with empathy and kinesthetic empathy, it was a good, venue in a one-on-one -on -one situation to, when, I, won't, I don't want to say test, but like inhabit material that we were going to work on and just really feel much more directly what happens when you do it. Mm -hmm. For example, breath holding, mm -hmm. like changing your breathing rhythm and how does that immediately affect or in, sort of infect the other person in the room? Because that's a real, that's kind of a base of, a, one of the main bases of the piece is is breath mm -hmm. and its rhythm and its manipulation of breath, some a process in your body that's totally unconscious, but you can consciously control it. Mm -hmm. 
and it is a very natural thing to um, unconsciously match with a person that you're right. in exchange with. And if you, if the person that you're meeting is really altering it, you then you start to notice it has that uh, slide spectrum between conscious and unconscious that is perceivable and cog cognitively and kinesthetically, and that, that it slides in and out. And I, we, it was really clear in the installation, and now I really trust it for the whole. Mm -hmm you know, for this show, that it is happening and watching it, performers do it enough and doing it myself. I actually had a moment, I don't know if it was in the dress rehearsal or last night, that we're in the end of the show, there's a lot, there's, I do a couple still positions that are pretty long, like five minutes or, I don't know, it feels like longer. And I was in it and sometimes when you're in a show and you're doing something and you're waiting for the next cue, your, your mind isn't like, your mind goes different places because you're waiting or you're doing this. And I realized in that moment, I was like, I'm breathing and that means I'm dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was just like a, a it just came to me like mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing right now. Even though I'm, I'm not moving my external shape at all, other things are happening around me, but I'm movement. in this dance yeah. because I'm breathing. That's mm -hmm. all I need to do. Yeah. And then in my other conversation was like, what if you were holding your breath? I was like, then I am too. <laughs> like the whole, I was. Uh, but in a way, it's the underscore, I think, for the whole piece. And sometimes we're working with it really obviously. And sometimes. Yeah, breathing and then how breathing affects your tone and the tone of the emotional, physiological tone. And that was really, yeah, how do you deal with the, t the interpersonal tone was a very interesting and challenging thing in the installation. Because, like all I've said, just to reiterate it, if you have someone really engaged, it's a wonderful experience. You know, yeah, you're like, yeah. oh my God, we're yeah. just doing this together. This is amazing. And you can do what you want. You have agency and I can do what I want. And we're here together. Yeah. And then there's some people that are just like, I'm against the wall and I'm looking at the floor and I'm not giving you anything. And I'm not gonna leave the room either because they told me I have to stay in here. Mm -hmm. So I don't have agency to leave the room, but I'm also not comfortable to look at you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know really what this is mm -hmm. and how do you find a way. You know, and this has really come out of, I think, performing in public places for a long time too. How do you invite people in, mm -hmm. you know? And how some people you, you can't, you know? Some yeah. people are just you not gonna try connect. Your best. Some, yeah. <laughs> some people you're not going to connect. It's just like that with people, mm -hmm. you know, in general. And, and you also don't know if they, if they're, what your effect is on them. Yeah. Right. That's you still right. don't know. Maybe yeah. they're having a wonderful time, yeah. but they're just, you just Or can't. it's really meaningful, yeah. but yeah, yeah they're yeah, taking they just, the dose. They're yeah. monitoring how much yeah. they can yeah. take at yeah. that and moment. A, and at, and at, where, at what point in their lives does it register? Mm -hmm. Also, like maybe it's not for five years later, mm -hmm. then it's sort of the penny mm -hmm. drops. And they're like, oh, that's what that experience was. Mm -hmm. But also that having that installation experience, also we have a lot of uh, moments when you were very close to the audience in mm -hmm. the show in terms of being downstage on the apron, but also being in the aisle or being in the public in the galleries. And so it really uh, revalidated that experience that having that personal interaction is, goes beyond aesthetics and that proximity matters in mm -hmm. that. And you can create that and we endeavor to create that in, you know, when Emily walks all the way upstage and mm -hmm. she's there mm -hmm. and she turns her back on you, just the feeling of what that is yeah. versus her front, you know, like there's little things like that, but then just reinforcing that with uh, Annika in the beginning coming down through the audience and her movement is so fast that you gets people into a reflexive place and just it, uh, yeah, it ha those two experiences of being close and then being in the whole room together, um, that dilation is really important. That's super effective too. You yeah. really felt the, the audience uh, it also felt like just, I don't know if people were seated more, uh -huh. kind of condensed also uh -huh. last night. It uh -huh. really felt like this, this circle. Uh-huh, yeah. I've never, you know, it, yeah. it, this, the housing can, the house can feel very, um, you know, back uh -huh. of the stage, but last night it felt, yeah, yeah. much more circular yeah, somehow. Totally. So energetically no. it already yeah. had influenced right. kind of um, yeah. bringing the piece yeah. into the whole Yeah, space. and maybe, I mean, maybe this thing of dilation, you know, that was also an underlying 
score within within the installation also that the audience had the volition and the performer had the volition to move you know closer together or further away and that transformed the lighting and the sound in the mm -hmm. space to amplify you know the intimacy or the distance and so that somehow very much fed into the work mm -hmm. as well and the Just lighting to, to have obviously. you know it's the it's the first time i really see the the height of the space mm -hmm. in the theater mm -hmm. and that uh yeah, I think that also, to see the negative space more clearly and holistically, mm. then it, it mm. does feel more circular, like we are mm. together in yes. this space. Right. Yeah. And Heidi yeah. did something that I think is really effective and maybe is not that noticeable, that she was like, I want all the lights out of the space, like yeah. no visible light, so it just looks like a, a space. Like we see the space. Yes. You know, we, and you obviously see some th pieces of the theater, like they left this open to see s and some the of doors, these electrics yeah. and everything, but... It, I think that not seeing the the lights and that kind of change of the line really do, does mm -hmm. something to. Mm -hmm. And then this set that Emmett made, he was totally referring to this space. Like that's where the whole idea came from, this space mm -hmm. and the work the, that he's done the here before. the ceiling is so high. He was like, we want to have the, the, the height and the big void, but we want to make a space that's smaller within it. Yeah. And so he made that, that vanishing point with the ropes to make a space where people could feel like they're inside something mm. as well, you know, in a smaller like transform space. Transform the perspective so performers looked bigger or smaller in relationship to it. Yeah. yeah. And did you consider that part of, because you spent a lot of time here developing mm -hmm. the piece in this space, yeah. but a lot of time researching it in other venues. Um, at what point were you thinking about the set integrating into the choreography? The, the set idea, like Emmett had that idea right from the beginning about some kind of dropped ceiling. And then we had this residency when we first started working together at, up at Lily Springs, which is a farm in Wisconsin mm -hmm. where they had just built a studio and we wanted to get out into nature yep. and, um, and work together for a, a week. A week. And uh, there was a washing line there that was really old and really spirally, like the plastic had all kind of warped and the line was kind of like this. And it was like multi, like five, or no, more. Rows. I don't know, yeah. rows yeah. of washing line. And Justin did this amazing improvisation in it with his arms, his long limbs, like just okay. getting kind of tangled and bouncing in this thing. And so I had then had this thought, well, what if we made a set that was easily transportable and we made it kind of like the washing line. And so that's where those two mm. ideas started merging, but it really wasn't until we got into the space for that tech residency in August that we had the opportunity to really try it out and see what it would look like. And then we met, tried to make somewhat of a replica of it in our studio, but it was very poor. So we couldn't really develop the whole ending of the piece until we got back into the theater like mm -hmm. a week ago. So mm -hmm. it was very like uh, tricky to try and figure out how to really integrate it and what we needed to do in order to make it kind of, uh, to use it in an organic way that A, it wasn't just there without being touched, but then B, it wasn't being touched just because it needed to be touched, mm -hmm. but somehow to really integrate it as this living, breathing um, organism mm -hmm. within to the work. So it starts as you know quite sterile and just neutral, and then it becomes this whole other mm -hmm. beast. And Justin does the same dance that he did at that residency, mm -hmm. which is September 2011, so it, it was, I guess it always had movement in the concept of it. It just, mm -hmm. it took us a while to understand how. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that layering happens a lot, even with the, especially with the sound mm -hmm. and having the recordings of previous rehearsals layered on a section and that um, how, as an audience member listening to the sound of dancers' feet in the space and it not synchronizing with what they're doing mm. is is so simple and mm. it's so effective. It's mm -hmm. really beautiful. Mm. Mm. That was that was something that Zena, I think, you know, we started playing with with the with the production in Lyon, mm -hmm. uh, with the Lyon Opera Ballet, and so some of that is like a, a kind of continuous conversation or exploration of that idea, yeah. and some of those recordings are 
from this group of performers and some of them are actually from the Lyon Opera Ballet mm. dancers. So yeah, yeah that's a, it's a cool thing to have that continuation because we and with, two of the dancers with, are with, with composers and from with that. Dancers. So it is their sound. Mm -hmm. and the new people sound and it's from the opera house in Lyon and mm -hmm. it's coming to you. It's mm -hmm. really... Uh, and then there's recordings from Theodore Wirth Park and there's recordings from this space as well. So there's sort of this layering of yeah. um, places and histories together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's nice. Mm -hmm. I'd like to... Um, there's, an, there's an edge with all the content, all the material, all the dancing, all the... All the the environment that's created that that stays on this line like so close to death and so close to birth and and there's like there's fighting and there's play and, and mm. it's very ambiguous mm -hmm. and how do you talk about that and what mm -hmm. are you know some of the background mm -hmm. or intentions with that mm -hmm. material mm -hmm. um, I mean our work is always starts from the physical mm -hmm. so a lot of it is about you know, going into physical states and then seeing what happens, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if they refer, I mean, if you go into a deep place, you start to refer to those, you know, experiences of your life or this, oh, I'm not saying this right. Um, because we start, maybe you have an answer. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm still processing what I yeah, want to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one, one piece of it is where I feel like as choreographers, we're choosing things that are as exciting to us kinesthetically. And, and one of the things that comes up in choosing things that are exciting to us kinesthetically is to leave things a little bit uh, open sometimes. So I think there's, there's material that's both really structured in the piece and then there's material also that's quite improvised and is quite raw. And that really, this, is, this doesn't speak directly mm -hmm. to your, I, I'm, I'm getting yep. there. But I feel like that sets a precedent for the performers to really, we're really asking for their engagement and for their full presence mm -hmm. because they're really in there making decisions yep. with us in that moment. And so there's a way somehow when stuff is a bit raw and a bit messy and there's multiple things going on at the same time and things are, are changing a little bit every night, that there's a way that your focus can shift differently around the piece, which is really exciting to me as a watcher. And you can completely miss, like everybody could have their own experience of the show then, you can completely miss one element because you're totally focused mm -hmm. on another element. And then all of a sudden there's this black uh, animal creeping on stage that you haven't seen for mm -hmm. 10 minutes. And then where did that come from? And then there's, you know, like there's these things that pull you through the space. And I think, in terms of the birth death piece, I mean, the, hmm. there's something about that in asking people to be fully present and really like self-responsible and show up and be really engaged that, that brings that question into the room for me. I mean, again, it's this mm -hmm. like Deborah Hay, aha, nada moment mm -hmm. a little bit, but it's also I think we're really working with the bodies and that's what bodies do. We are born and we die and we are being birthed and dying. Our cells are, are, mm -hmm. are regenerating all the time. So it's sort of an inherent part of our working process. And I think it must appeal to us on an unconscious level on, in some way to, to cross that whole terrain. I mean, I don't know how else to... Do you have another way of articulating that? I mean, we're really working in the research and the physical research for the piece. It's like we're really working with the tissues of the body. We work with the bones. Mm -hmm. We work with how the bones are full of blood. We work with the blood flowing through the body. We work with the heart. We work with the digestive organs. You know, we really, we're working with the materials of the body. And part of that is that we eat and we mm -hmm. shit and we, you know, we eat, digest and we shit. Part of that is that we are born and we evolve and that we were single cell beings who evolved into mm -hmm. complex cell beings who all of a sudden had, you know, six limbs, a head, a tail, arms and legs, you know, and develop language. Like all of those pieces are part of our working process and how we develop mm -hmm. the material and so. And throughout the piece, it's almost like we're going backwards in time, mm. you know, coming yeah. out of the, the blanket monster 
the amphibians and, and how clear it is that, you know, they've um, morphed and mm. become something much more mm -hmm. primal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a real play with, with uh, I guess, planet, that's like a planetary time, uh -huh. you know, like how de-evolution into, you know, origins of life on the planet coming to where we are. And uh, if you, we worked a lot with condensing that time, like if you were gonna be traveling and you were like evolving and mutating, as a being over a, like millions of years and mm -hmm. you were embodying that as you did it, like mm -hmm. what would that be like? Right. You know, we started out with these other different travelings, but then we saw just like, what if you added the, you know, that geo, it's not even ontogenetic time into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Like if you would. You were an evolving species basically. Yeah. I mean, and, and I keep thinking, you know, I keep, I mean, we speak, you know, the, this piece is a is a is a mallard, is an uh, ecological melodrama. So for me, there's you know there's lots of layers in it, and one of the layers is this idea of also you know in 50 years we're going to lo lose a third of the species on the planet. So is the black blanimal you know the extinct species? You know, like is that a representation of all these animals that we're not going to have anymore? Are we? You know, is everyone trying to pass through all the, this whole range of diversity and then we're not going to have, you know, that diversity is just not going to be here actually for our children or our grandchildren. So how are, how are those things also, you know, kind of questions around larger metaphors or practices that are uh, trying to embody and honor that, you know, history on, on the planet in the way of those life forms of all these other beings? And the blanimal is the blanket animal. Yes, blanket the, animal. thank yeah. you very much. And there's two blanimals. Yeah. But yeah. Beige blanimal. The beige blanimal and the black yeah. blanimal. We got into this whatever, inside joke of contracting two words together in the piece. There's yeah. a lot of yeah, thank you for contracted words. <laughs> um, but actually that, you know, it's a fun, it's a kind of like a joke, but it's also just about mashing two things together and making them one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, blanket animal, like, yeah. I think there, it, it sort of like was like an inside joke that actually becomes content. Mm -hmm. Just like what we were saying about evolution, like if you were to mash two things together that don't necessarily go together and say them as one word to acknowledge that, that, that you know, you've put multiple meanings on this one thing so it should have a different word. Mm -hmm. It isn't a sentence anymore, it's just mm -hmm. this one thing. And it, I was thinking, Olive, when you were talking about the species uh, and extinction and moving through different species, just that that, that can apply to also movement vocabulary, just that we have such a, a range of possibilities within the scope of our body, which in a way seems so limited sometimes mm. what you can do because between this joint and that joint, you know, like I don't, what can I do? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, then we even, uh, and I talk about just like all of Western dance, like formally even going even further to restrict what the possibilities of the body are and by putting on formal languages, sure. mm -hmm. you know, like that is... Social language, but also dance, specific yeah, dance the, styles, is that dance what you're Dance styles to? and the language of uh -huh. dance styles and working in a formal mm -hmm. manner is about mm -hmm. a distillation of what mm -hmm. humans can do and, mm -hmm. you know, a perfecting or, a, you know, essentializing this mm -hmm. form and patterns and, every, and everything like that. And I feel like in our work, we really are thinking about expanding what your body could do, and we're trying to ex do that in a way that is open to viewing in a way that, that we think is bringing the person-to-person -person identification uh, as opposed to a person watching and identifying with dance history. Mm -hmm. Like seeing, okay, like this is looks like Cunningham and that looks like... Alwyn Nicolai. Yeah, well, okay, Alwyn Nicolai. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. But, you know, it's not, and it's not like to diss that history. Yeah, you but know, to and include not, all of it yeah, but without, to just, but, but do it in a, another way. But to bring our, yeah. our our approach into that conversation is to be like, what can we do if we, if we don't engage in these histories in a direct way mm -hmm. in terms of representation? Like sure. if we look at what people are doing and we try to edit and delete, you know, things that refer to, direct, to dance history mm -hmm. so that we can access another kind of viewing. 
that said, that, that's like a base in our work. But that said, in this process of excavating empathy, I feel like we are allowing some of this dance vocabulary, like Western dance vocabulary, in because of its empathetic value. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of slipped in. There's like just moves that have like slipped in. Like what Justin does and what Emily does and what Anna do in their, solo, in yeah. their solos refer to a s certain dance vocabularies. And in general, mm -hmm. we would go in and direct that out, direct it out of them yep. and, you know, change it so it doesn't have that representation of dance. But then when we were looking at it like empathetic lens or actually what Annika and Francesca do is almost, it's like ballet. Yep. And they have that training and they can do it like, you know, it's off the hook. And so we're just like looking at, you know, what that does, the lift up, like empathetically, mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of just looking at it as a form and being like, okay, we want to refer to something right. else. We're like, what comes out of these forms? What is that, that physical practice? Mm -hmm. How is that really reading? What's underneath yeah. aesthetics that is mm -hmm. empathetic that mm -hmm. we want to kind of sample mm -hmm. somehow or pull out mm -hmm. of that? And that has been really interesting just to have a different conversation with, you know, our dance history mm -hmm. and dance form mm -hmm. coming at it from that other angle. Mm -hmm. We're not totally negating it. We're just curating or excavating the parts of it that we feel like deliver the kind of feeling that we want. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, that's been really interesting to see. And that reads really well with the audience because they, they, they recognize on. people on stage, the feeling, the states, and then all of a sudden to have a little hip twist surprises you and, yeah. and, and, and gets a reaction really yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. quickly. Yeah, it's like the familiarity, yeah. you get to hook on to it, yeah. you know? Then you're like, oh, but where are we going now? <laughs> yeah. And I think in particular, Anna's solo and Emily's solo mm -hmm. really play with that a mm -hmm. lot, where they're, you see just the complexity of what, of what they're doing because they're in their emotional body mm -hmm. and they're and doing their animal this, body. Mm -hmm. And their animal body and they're doing kind of like our work, like our body. scores, but they're also somehow bringing their whole dance history into it and their own comments on it. Yeah. You know, so it's really complicated. Yeah. Yeah, you what can feel doing. like you're let in on the jokes, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. really, it's not, uh, it never alienates the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really clear. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of the other scores, maybe break down some of the, yeah. um, the sections and mm -hmm. let us in on some of the language mm -hmm. that you use? Mm -hmm. So there's these, there's these three solos back to back with the woman, Annika's entrance, and she's working with this changing uh, muscular tone material. So really like shifting, not making specific movement, but really shifting the tone in her muscles, which then shifts her body, right? Mm -hmm. Shifts her limbs, her arms, her legs, everything through the space. So and like, even her relationship to people as she's coming down the stairs or to the group who's on stage, shifts her perception. So instead of thinking about like, I wanna move my arm in this, in this shape, you would just work with the, the muscle tone and then the shape would be a byproduct mm -hmm. in her solo. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole group section where it gets very bright and everybody's moving and Justin moves the ropes and then there's this duet with Timmy and Francesca. Everybody's working with that content mm -hmm. in that moment. There's also a whole spinning section because I think really working with the spinnings really affecting the audience's sense of uh, uh, <laughs> a, a sense of balance in their own bodies, like it's really affecting the vestibular system. And I think that's a direct empathetic um, uh, read also, the breathing. And what Anna is about. doing is she is um, working with how does her, the, her movement affect her breathing and how does her breathing affect her movement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty simple one. Mm -hmm. uh, what else are we doing? We're working with, um, you also talked about the animal, the, the traveling. Mm, we yeah. kind of looked at evolutionary uh, movement patterns. And so there's, perform the, so the dancers are working with these kind of evolving species, this idea of the evolving species and having multiple limbs or no limbs or one limb and how does that inform the way they can travel. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, also starts to bring in, uh, that section starts to bring in ideas too of like cells mm -hmm. yeah. combining and really, um, and even like right, once they the electricity start building together. That, yeah. Well, uh -huh. even inside the cell, when the, you know, inside the cell, 
before it divides, there's like an electromagnetic force that pulls the DNA to two sides of the cell, mm. and then it divides, and then those cells come together. So it's even like like a magnetism of how yeah. cells come together and how they fit together, yeah. and how the they are in a water environment. They're not mm -hmm. on a in air, so the gravity is different and how they could you know, fit mm -hmm. together in mm -hmm. different shape mm -hmm. than if we're dealing with gravity. And a lot of the second section, that you kind of were in the forest and then it's sort of like a swamp and then we're like, in the end when the ropes come down, it's like we're in the ocean. Yeah. You know, so we've gone back to like back this big fluids. wave, yeah. you know, and the water movement or the movement of the space around you is affecting your movement as much as your own movement. Yeah you know, that you're connected to the space in this watery subgravity way as opposed to just the agency of moving yourself across a surface. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's a score, but that's yeah. kind of context. <laughs> yeah, no, you're really moving space with, with, with energy and empathy and, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, I can see all that coming through yeah. the, the yeah. piece. It's yeah. nice to hear you talk about it. And then all the way through there's these little social interruptions that happen. So either, mm -hmm. even though we're in the middle of the forest, there's this weird, you know, hugging, um, rescuing, fighting thing that transforms someone into an animal. And then there's someone else who passes out and needs to be resuscitated, but the person who's resuscitating them doesn't know how. And then there's, you know, so there's these little constant breaks that we are still human beings amidst all this other stuff that's mm -hmm. becoming more and more abstract in a way mm -hmm. through the arc of the work. Yeah. Uh, this little um, uh, surgery that happens, the mm -hmm. evolutionary biologist surgery transforming an amoeba into a, uh, yeah. Into a, into a dog, I don't know, <laughs> into a mammal. Yeah. So there's references to, to, to peopleness still in the midst of the, yeah. the, the terrain, yeah. the landscape. And then Emily's solo is, um, it's based on a series of experiments we did, which we would watch someone dance in a closed space. And whenever we felt moved by what they were doing, which could be any way, like you thought something, you had a physical response, change of breathing, um, you spaced out, anything, we were, any way you were moved, we would name that to be empathy of some kind. And when you felt it, you would say yes at that moment. So you were communicating to the person dancing when you felt moved and then also to everyone around, everyone got to see who felt moved at what point. Mm -hmm. And that's what her solo came from. Mm -hmm. And then we do it on stage. We do the same thing, but we don't say yes because we realized earlier in the piece that actual language, the language, the actual yeah. words mm -hmm. were so identifying that we took the words out and just made affirmative sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another section where there's two duets happening. We played a lot with like the ideas of like shifting our value system, like public face, private face, like relating to the pelvic floor and the face and switching the, the orientation of what you give value to or how you give value to them. So we call that public face, private face, for example, or thinking about the pelvis and the head, mm -hmm. um, these two kind of big centers of gravity in the body and how are we, when we're making the fitting piles, how are we, these piles towards the end of the piece that we were talking about earlier, you know, what is the relationship between the pelvis and the head when you put your head right next to somebody's pelvis? What does that read as, you know, imagistically? And then what is it to really take someone's head and manage somebody's body by taking their head? Because that's not something we do very often in mm -hmm. everyday life to mm -hmm. really, like, you know, hold someone's head here and, and, and carry them through the space. So, so we played a lot with this like exploration of somehow the pelvis and the head. And, and I think that comes out uh, in the end section, but I think it also comes out in this duet yeah. to these, the double duet section. Because when you take someone's head, it's not just their head, it's their, all their perceptions and their brain, you know, and their sense right. of equilibrium, mm -hmm. you know, so you're, you're taking a huge, Hugely all, manipulative, mm -hmm. right. all the reflexes Dis that develop throughout your life, like, like 80% of them have to do with your neck, mm. you know, so it's like a big thing. And I think that the, the delicacy and the tenderness that comes out in that section is because you 
understand the gravity of what it's like to control someone's head. Right. And you don't want to just use it as luggage. Mm -hmm. But we did try doing that. So <laughs> that piece if you just pretend that their head is luggage and then you just walk around and they're like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that's sort of homage to Meg Stewart because I know uh -huh. one of her first pieces was her just manipulating someone's head in a really rough mm. yes. way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. With the and feet. Just figure study, right? Yeah. It's yeah. The, the feet are moving. Yeah. <laughs> and why, um, you know, we've talked a lot about empathy as as a, a goal. Mm -hmm. Can why? you talk about why? So, do you want to? I have my answer. Why? What? Well, say your answer. Yeah, then. Mm -hmm. um, so, why empathy? I feel that. The, the, you know, I feel like there's many reasons why. And one of the reasons on a very sort of logistical or practical level is for us to understand how to make something for a venue of this scale after, you know, having made a lot of work in public spaces or in more intimate locations and how do we continue to bring our audience with us. So that's a very sort of logistical mm -hmm. reason why. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I think a, a larger reason why for me is uh, what do we care about? Like what do we wanna see in the artwork we go and experience? Like what's important to us at this moment on the planet? What do we, what do we care about? And one of the things that I care about is I, I, I want to know that people are not just cognitively reading and experiencing the world, but they're really having a feeling experience mm -hmm. and, and, and giving value to that feeling experience. Because I think we're living on, an, uh, you know, we're living on this planet and we are in an ecological crisis moment. And it's really confusing as to sort of to know how we should behave and what we should do because we all feel so much and it's so overwhelming and we don't know how to take action. And, and, and mm -hmm. for me, I don't know how to live with integrity. I'm just trying to do my mm -hmm. best, you know, mm -hmm. but it's like, if I can really include how I feel and not only how I think, mm -hmm. then I, I think I'm in a better place. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I, if I can bring all of that into the room and really be honest, and even if what I think and what I feel are two different things, mm -hmm. how can I let those things speak to each other? And, you know, if we could only have our leaders, you know, make choices from a place of embodied experience and really take their feelings into account, you know, we would be living in a very different world, you know? Yep. And I say that in this moment of watching the political debates or just, you know, watching what's happening right now, uh, just on a larger global level. So for me, I, it's important for me to make work that embodies a value system that, uh, that is, you know, that is my value system, but that I can share that with my audience in mm -hmm. some way. So I guess I'm really interested in what experience people have in the audience and what, not just what they're cognitively understanding, but what they're viscerally experiencing and how does that make them feel? And, and what, what does the work do to them as it keeps, as the floor keeps dropping out somehow? Like, where is it taking them? Because I don't want to dictate that. I, I'm trying to create an experience, you know. The, uh, trying to, yeah. We, we have tried to create something that has room for everybody to have their own experience of and, and, and to really invite them in and to really invite their full engagement mm -hmm. and attention and, yeah, and, and, and to give value to that experience. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's why empathy for me. I don't know if you want to add anything <laughs> to that. Yeah, I guess what I, could, what I could add yeah. is just another layer of it is that it's kind of, it's an excavation of what is already operating in dance mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. and in my own dancing practice and I guess then by extension court, my choreography, right. I feel like I am constantly going backwards and forwards. Like what, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. And what if I change the why? Will it 
change what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and if I if I change what I'm doing, does it change my motivations of why I'm doing mm -hmm. what I'm doing? And as we were working with, I mean, empathy is is just huge in dance. <laughs> I mean, dance is like it's, an empathy that's machine. It's, it's, yeah. what it's, it's what dance is based on. So yeah. it's kind yeah. of like trying to deconstruct like the primary driving force mm -hmm. behind the art form in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah, think about learning you know? dance. Mm -hmm. It's all about empathy. You know, there's someone, a lot of time, a lot of dance, you know, traditional dance is, is based on one person showing you mm -hmm. what to do and then you're following it as a group. And even that, if you think of it as like really functional copying, you without empathy, what is co there is no copying, mm -hmm. you know, because the person, you know, demonstrating like Cunningham technique is not saying, bend your upper spine as you're going. I mean, they can say that, but to actually, if you don't see them and you don't kind of feel what they're doing and do it at the same time, you, you it's not really dance. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. some sort of other like physical therapy or some uh, some other experience. So it's just so underlying what we do. It's really interesting to make it, instead of being underlying, put right. it on top. Right. And then be like, okay, then it's on the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, it's how we do what we do and it's what we're doing. <laughs> we like, so the top and the bottom get compressed and then mm -hmm. you're like, can spread it out to, mm -hmm. you know, see how far it can go or mm -hmm. what can you do. And, I mean, the question of choreographing empathy is also very interesting because it's something that you can endeavor to do and you can feel like you have things that you know people will feel a certain way and those can be pretty known and uh, clear, but at the same time, you'll never be inside of another person's experience. So right. it's this paradoxical thing that you're trying to do something impossible and you get a feeling that yes, this is totally direct because I feel that it is, but mm -hmm. it's I, it's me that's feeling it. It's not you, right? You know, so we can share an experience and be really clear about it, and you know, and in some experiences, it's totally clear. Like everyone's had that when you're with someone. Like that's what love is like. You know, mm -hmm. you feel like, okay, we're together. Mm -hmm. You know, in this, and you have mm -hmm. that feeling. You know, it just gives me chills just to even, mm -hmm. you know, think about it. And, and if you working with that primary drive like how, what what is your body going to do mm -hmm. like what do you, what do you have to do to bring bring yourself into that situation again and again like mm -hmm. what what are you going to have to use and so you were talking about like birth and death like early, a, a mm -hmm. bunch earlier and it is those kind of experiences that have that sense of immediacy you know that mm -hmm. like this is what's happening right now you know, and like, let's pay attention to what's happening mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. empathy does that because mm -hmm. we're, it's, it's in the moment. It's not like you, you can remember experiences that you've had and refer to them later, but you, it's not something that you, it's something that happens in the moment, yeah. you know, and that is yeah. very wonderful reminder and practice to be in, in performing. And I think that that can translate to the, to the audience and to each other on stage. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just like a, it's like a huge context, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think in this work, it also really allows us to play with movement that's virtuosic and complicated. And it also allows us to play with really mundane, you know, movement too, because the audience has then you know, the experience of rolling on the floor, maybe, mm -hmm. or of standing around awkwardly in a mm -hmm. social situation. It's like, what are they, what are the experiences that they already know in their mm -hmm. own body and how are we speaking, like, on the sort of these multiple levels to who's in the room and then there's, what's happening on stage? There's a little bit of, like, uh, uh, cultural empathy that comes in, like, in this duet with, with Anna and Francesca, where she's doing kind of what, what we call that section, unwanted massage. And so she is using touch and kind of like f sort of really bizarre energetic or fake massage and she has a microphone and she's making this, amplifying the sounds of what she's doing and I, I feel like that's pretty direct. Like Anna's response, who's from the... Minnesota. Who's from Minneapolis and then uh, Francesco's from Milan, Italy you know, just a totally expressive culture, and then Minnesota, yeah. like <laughs> Swedish Lutheran, you know, and, and just the feeling of Anna's rejection of the experience, but politeness to stay with it, yeah. I feel like is so tangible and yeah. concrete that yeah. I feel like we're all feeling the same thing. Yeah. 
and it's funny and we're laughing because it's funny, but why is it funny? Because we feel uncomfortable too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like what if someone yeah. was doing that? I mean, she's like touching her breasts <laughs> and she picks her up and she's putting a microphone on her inner thigh. I mean, it's like over the top. I mean, it's, an, it's not, that's not. But it's for Anna's well-being, yeah, you know? Is. She is healing her. Yeah, so. yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't think. I've been but it's that we've all maybe had those situations. It's like you go to a, a body worker for the first time or even a doctor, and it's just it's like, you know, it's a very human experience. Uh -huh. You know, it's like what's uncomfortable or unfamiliar, yeah. inappropriate, appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what's next? The boundaries between fake and real. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Comfort um, and discomfort. I, I, yeah, we're thinking about. I don't know, we've been thinking about the installation kind of as, as part one of this piece, mm -hmm. and now we're looking at a piece that, are not it's not fully formed yet, but it's something about not just part one, part two, a, a, like installation and a theater show, but taking the one-on-one -on -one performance to lots of different contexts, mm. like in public spaces, in gallery context, maybe on stage, but just in multiple performers, like an audience member doing one-on-one -on -one experiences with multiple performances, performers as an evening. Mm -hmm. um, as an evening length work. I was, yeah. and what I'm imagining, I'll, uh, what I, I can say that I imagine that it doesn't just happen in one location, like it happens in both a, a public space and like a theater or a public space and a gallery so that it, it can be in an environment that you have more control and then an environment in which you have less control. And that one audience member would meet like three or five performers through the course of the experience. Um, and so it's something that could be very adaptable to develop to different locations, mm -hmm. which would be really fun. Yeah. But it really speaks to the, this question of empathy, intimacy, um, and also accessibility, like how do we meet people? you know, and how do we bring people into dance and into like a kinesthetic engagement or experience um, that has meaning for them. Oh. So in a way it's, it's coming out of where we are, Yeah. but it's yeah. looking at, again, the context that that experience happens in and change, like if, like if you would to, it would be like the stage show and if you had it in through the, each individual performers, if you were following them through the show, like if you could walk around and just watch that one person. Yeah. And we wanted to do that, actually, we didn't have time, but we were like, one rehearsal, it would take, you know, uh, seven hours to, or to watch each individual person do the show mm -hmm. without the other people. Right. Just fo follow. Just the, their role. Yeah, just their role, and just watch them. And then it would be interesting to watch, but also for the performer, like a lot of times when you're performing, you're like, okay, this is highlighted and I'm still in the back. That's how everyone's watching that. You know that, you can feel it, you yeah. know it functionally. But if it just someone was just watching you all the time and they could move all around you and see all angles and it would just change your performance. Nothing's invisible. Nothing, yeah. yeah. Even your crossover in the and, back. And yeah. also for the audience, they're not invisible. Yeah. You know, so it brings that other, right. like, that's, we had that taste with this installation and I think it's just taking that and expanding that mm -hmm. experience because that was a... Yeah, and part of it, I mean, one of the things that Justin Jones said about being an installation, it's like your audience has access to seeing every surface of your body in that experience, you know? Just to reiterate that, it's like 360 degree, like, visibility. So I think that's, a, you know, a really great departure point in terms of continuing. How do you have awareness you know, um, and, and and sort of an empathetic engagement or dance going on. I mean, I'm not saying that it's flat to be performing in a stage context, but it's like when someone's really this close to you, it's a very different, you know, it's a very different way of performing. Yeah. And so there's something mm -hmm. in that research that I think is definitely the seed for the next piece. But then you can even look right. at, like, thinking about this, reference to dance history, that's what a pirouette is. Mm -hmm. It's about showing. Right. Every single 360, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Just functionally, that's, yeah. The, yeah. that's yeah. ballet technology. Yeah. Show every side, quickly. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. And I, think, and I think that we're gonna work with a, a, 
a cast that is of various ages and experiences and, and sizes and hopefully going to work with um, the younger dancer in this show again, mm -hmm. Willa, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> possibly some people from Interact again, Center mm -hmm. for uh, Center for Performing Arts and mm -hmm. Visual Arts. So mm -hmm. It's still, you know, we haven't even finished this show. Yeah. So. <laughs> we've got to tour this show yeah. first. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. in. Uh, well, yeah. I wish you lots of luck. Yeah, I'm so you. excited and yeah. can't wait to see it again tonight. Yeah, yay. Thanks. Thank you so, thank yeah. you so much, Michelle. Yeah, yay. thank you so much, Michelle, for everything. Yeah. yeah.